Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight our subject is objectivism, but from a particular perspective in relation to rationalism and empiricism, or more exactly, in contrast to rationalism and empiricism. I want to explain how the objectivist approach differs from both of the ones we've been covering in regard to thinking, in general, understanding philosophy, dealing with ideas, writing. We're going to cover basically the same points that we've covered on rationalism and empiricism, but now from the objectivist point of view, and our stress is going to be on the methodology of thinking, how to use the mind to its greatest advantage. Now, first of all, I want to state briefly as a reminder the objectivist view on the mind-body question in general. As you know, rationalism and empiricism are two sides of the mind-body dichotomy. The rationalists are the spiritualists. In one form or another, they disdain the material world, the senses, the physical. And the empiricists, in effect, are the materialists, disdaining concepts, thought, the operation of the mind. The rationalists focus on the inner, as we said in the opening night, and in effect dispense with the outer, with reality. The empiricists try to be outer-oriented, but at the price of dispensing with any inner standards, principles, conceptualizations. Now, objectivism is the first philosophy to stand for the integration of mind and body on every issue and across the board. It denies that there is a war, that there is a dichotomy, that you have to choose in any form. In other words, they regard the whole thing as a false alternative. There is no clash on any level, including no clash between the inner and the outer, and no need to choose. We deny the soul-body dichotomy, to use that term, or the mind-body dichotomy, whatever it's called. Now, to give you a brief reminder as to why before we go through the points in order. First of all, there is no ineffable, mystic soul. If we use the term soul, and there's nothing against it, we use it to designate an aspect of man's consciousness. Similarly, the term mind designates an aspect of consciousness, the conceptual faculty. And the key point here is that consciousness, according to objectivism, and we're speaking here now in the broadest sense, whether human or animal, consciousness is a part of nature. It's a fact of reality. It's an attribute possessed under definite conditions by certain living organisms. Putting it negatively, it is not unnatural. It is not supernatural. It is through and through a natural faculty. And its function is not to attune us to a mystical dimension, but to perceive physical reality. In other words, the world of nature revealed by our senses. Now, all of this is really just an elaboration of what's contained in Galt's axiomatic statement. Existence exists, and the act of grasping that implies two corollary axioms, that something exists, and that one exists possessing consciousness, consciousness being the faculty of perceiving that which exists. And in that characterization of consciousness, the whole thing is, in, is implicit, because consciousness is nothing but the faculty of perceiving the something that exists, which is physical nature. So the integration of consciousness and existence is implicit in the axiom, in lack of any dichotomy. And the mind-body integration is just a way of spelling that out as it applies to uh, man. Human consciousness, therefore, is this worldly in its essence and function, just as this worldly as is the human body. And when the two elements, mind and body, are united, that constitute a single indivisible entity, man. Now, you know that according to Ms. Rand's uh, statement here, man is a being made of two attributes, consciousness and matter, or mind and body. The function of the mind is to acquire knowledge and define values. 
the function of the body in this connection, in its relation to the mind, is to carry out the conclusions and value judgments of the mind. Each of these attributes, as Atlas Shrugged discusses in great detail, is indispensable to the other and to the total entity, which is man. Without a mind, man has no means of knowledge and no way to direct his actions or preserve his life. Without a physical brain and body, we can have no consciousness or ideas at all, let alone any way of carrying out our ideas in action. The two elements are two indivisible aspects of one harmonious, integrated entity. Now, the task of philosophy should simply be to carry out this principle, the mind-body integration, to every cardinal issue of philosophy. Tonight I want to take the topics, I believe we had eight that we covered from different points of view under rationalism and empiricism, go down the list, and in each case my theme is going to be that the answer to the false alternative of rationalism versus empiricism is grasping the mind-body integration. All right, point one. I'll take these in the same order that I cover them, of the other two approaches. The relation of ideas to reality. Rationalism says ideas above reality. Empiricism says reality above ideas. Ideas are to be dispensed with. Objectivism says ideas are the means of knowing reality. It's not one or the other. Not floating ideas, not raw, concrete bound data which is unconceptualized. The nature of knowledge is facts conceptualized. Facts grasped through the medium of ideas. Now, this whole approach is inherent in the objectivist concept of concept. And that is why introduction to objectivist epistemology is so central to the whole objectivist approach. In essence, leaving out a lot of complexities, concepts are integrations of percept. That's the essential point from the introduction to objectivist epistemology. They have no content other than the percepts, the concretes that they integrate. They are a way of holding an endless number of instances far beyond what we could grasp by direct perception in one mental unit. And this is true of every concept, whether it's table or something so abstract as honesty. Honesty is simply a way of holding the countless concrete acts, cases, instances of honest behavior, all the millions and trillions of times that people tell the truth, that they face facts, that they don't, make up a mythical other reality and try and retreat to it. There's thousands, millions, unlimited number of such cases. And honesty is simply a way of retaining the sum of them in one mental unit so we can have in one lecture, we can come to a conclusion about all of those instances, the great majority of which we will never dream of thinking of or actually experiencing. So as against Plato and the rationalists, concepts are not means of attuning yourself to another dimension. They are shorthand ways of retaining concretes in this world. But they are inextricably tied to concretes, therefore their whole content is the concretes that they sum up. And as against the empiricists, concepts are not, as empiricists hold, subjective, arbitrary, social, without any basis in reality. Concepts are ways of integrating concretes based on the actual nature of those concretes. So they are objective, not subject. They are based on reality for purposes of our cognition. Essentially, the purpose is to expand the crow, to enable us to take all those countless concretes in one unit and thereby deal with it, whereas otherwise we could not. So they're a device of our minds based on reality. Now the whole 
secret, uh, that's an extreme statement, but let's at least say a very, very major part of the whole secret to a healthy mental process is to keep the two dimensions going in your mind at the same time. In other words, uniting percepts and concepts, abstractions and concrete. Properly, if you have trained yourself to the right mental process, you should have, I'm deliberately putting this in a kind of funny terms, but to try to impress it on you, you should have a continuous dual urge. One part of your mind should always be straining in the direction of thought, abstractions, concepts. Another part should be straining in the direction of percepts, observations, concretes. Whichever one you're on, you should feel the need implicitly to do the other also. It's like a, just a temporary division of labor. You look away from one for the moment, but the longer you look, the more it should be beating against your mind. I'm leaving that dimension out, and vice versa. Now let's give some cases where this would apply. First of all, in the midst of any abstract discussion, you should have a continuous urge to concretize, illustrate, apply. There should be an inner pressure to point to examples of what you're talking about in reality. You should feel that inner need growing with each new abstraction, each new general principle that's piled into your discussion, until you literally can't stand it until you feel, I simply cannot go on with this discussion until I start to concretize. So for instance, if you are discussing honesty, you can take an abstract argument, and it's important up to a point. But after we define honesty, and we relate it to rationality, and we say a few things about man's relation to reality, and you have a whole bunch of abstractions now working, you should feel a desperate need. Well, what does it mean practically? What would be an example? How do these abstractions actually work out? And if you remember our discussion, we kept on giving uh, concretes. And the same would be true for the evil of force or the validation of rights or any topic. On the other side, in the midst of an observation of concretes, you should have an urge to conceptualize, to integrate, to unite, to find the common denominator. Because the more the concretes are multiplied, the more the crow should be rearing its head and you're feeling, I just can't retain all this. So you will have an urge to unify, to reduce the amount of concretes by some sort of abstraction or principle. And that's why, if you get a presentation such as uh, we demonstrated under honesty, you know, where you just jump from one concrete to the other to the other, your mind should begin to boggle. You just can't take it. What do these have in common? What is the principle? Now, obviously, you cannot do them both literally simultaneously. You have to focus from one to the other. The point is, whichever one you're doing, you have to remember that the other is there and that it's waiting to be done. Both of them are crucial. They have to go along together. Now another application of this is to the topic of definitions. You need definitions. And a definition consists of narrowing your focus, ignoring a tremendous amount about the thing you're defining, focusing on just the attribute that's going to be definitional whether you're talking about the welfare state or man. There's all kinds of attributes, as you know, which you have to leave out. You have to ignore. If you just sat and looked at those huge quantity of attributes, your mind would be paralyzed. But the point is you have to ignore them. You have to work with the definition. You have to use that. And at the same time, there has to be a pressure, an urge within you to say, there's a tremendous number of other attributes besides this definition. I must never constrict my concept to equate it just with the definition. I've got to have this inner need to keep going back to reality and reminding myself of all these other attributes that I am temporarily dropping. 
My definition is a condensation. What does it condense? What are the other kinds of things that are involved? So again, a twofold urge. In the midst of a survey of attributes, there's a need to condense them, to bring it down to an essence so that you can hold it. On the other hand, by focusing, when you focus on the essential, there should be a need to know well, what is it the essential of? What are the other attributes? I'll give you another example because this permeates every aspect of the thinking process. Every specialization has to be paired with an integration. By specialization, I mean a deliberate focus on some one subject. Now, obviously, all thinking is that. You can't think about everything in general. If you focus on honesty, you're already specialized. You're delimiting your attention to honesty. You're leaving out all the other virtues, the rest of philosophy, chemistry, physics, astronomy, vast, vast torrents of things. And of course, we simply have to do that. We have a finite capacity. We cannot take the totality in at once. If you think of honesty, you can't also think of independence, integrity, and so on. But the key point here is, as you specialize throughout, there should be pressing on your mind as your future, and not too far distant future, the goal, I'm looking at this separately, but I have to integrate, I have to connect it to the other topics, otherwise I can't really grasp it. I have to see how does honesty relate to independence and integrity and whatever else is uh, significant. There we get back to the point of Hegel's that I like, or his formulation, the true is the whole. So when you look at a part, you have to remember that until you see it in relation to the whole, you have not fully grasped it. On the other hand, the whole can only be grasped through its parts, in steps, in stages, by specializing and saying, I'm going to ignore the rest for now and just focus on this. So again, there should be a twofold urge. When you survey the total, for instance, ethics as a whole, and make general statements about that, you should have the inner need, do I know what the parts of it are? And on the other hand, when you focus on some one part, you should have a constant sense of, I have to keep this connected to uh, the total. Compartmentalization, which I mentioned under both rationalism and empiricism, is a major flaw uh, one of the major attributes of poor thinking is exactly the essence of compartmentalization is specialization without integration. It consists of taking some one area, zeroing in on it, which we have to do, and then just leaving it separate as an entity apart from the rest of cognition. And that is uh, disastrous. So on every aspect of thinking, the key to a proper methodology which will prevent you from being rationalist in another dimension or concrete bound and empiricist is the consistent union of the two by means of oscillating back and forth. That's the essence of the objectivist methodology. The union of the two. And I think, therefore, symbolically, it's very interesting that uh, Ayn Rand preferred to write uh, her philosophy in the form of fiction. Now, that is not mandated, obviously, by what I'm saying, because you don't have to write philosophy as floating abstractions. But nevertheless, it's very significant. She did not want to present philosophy as a series of abstractions, even with some hypothetical examples. She wanted the actual union. And her typical novel is a whole series of concretes, which is the plot, the beginning, the, the whole first part of it, and then the abstractions at the end in Kira's speech, or Rourke's speech, or Gold's speech. That is the so-called empirical and the rational, more exactly the concretes and the abstractions. And she had to write it in the form of fiction, essentially, because she could not abide floating abstractions. Therefore, to her, nor could she just write a story without saying, well, what does it mean? What's the abstraction? What's the principle? And therefore, although I'm certainly not saying that if you don't write novels, you're doomed, it's, it's significant to me, it's typical of uh, her characteristic approach philosophically that she would write that kind of novel. If you're interested in this, I, I've just written a, 
fairly lengthy analysis of her actual literary style, which is going to appear in this uh, book, uh, The Early Ayn Rand. And in it, I make as the key to her style, which I'll just leave you this as tantalizing, the integration of concretes and abstractions. That is the actual way she constructs her paragraphs, let alone the novels as a whole. So that would just be, when you, if and when you look at that, you'll see a, uh, another example of this same point. All right, let us look at point two. This is the issue of induction and deduction. Now, of course, here again, the integrated em employment of both is the proper approach. Each has a role. Induction grasps principles or generalizations, general laws. Deduction applies them to new cases. Deduction is therefore not useless, as the empiricists say. It does give new knowledge, but knowledge of ap application, of applying a general principle to a new concrete situation. The prime process of these two, however, while I don't want a slight deduction, the prime cardinal process of knowledge is induction. That necessarily has to precede deduction. That's what gives you the generalizations, the principles that deduction then applies. That's what gives you the real meat of knowledge. Now, the proper relation of induction and deduction was contained in our discussion of life as the standard. You notice it was essentially inductive, that knowledge. We observed certain facts about living entities that differentiated them from inanimate things. And the whole proof derived from that observation. Now notice we were generalizing. We were inducing in the very act of forming the concept of living entity. We were saying there are a certain type of thing in this category, living thing, and all of them have special kinds of attributes, special kind of structure, special type of action. They need a special course of action to sustain them, as against all the things in this other category, the inanimate, which are different. Now, this is an essential induction required to reach the very concept of the living versus the inanimate. Then, once we've done that by observation and generalization, we grasp that crucial distinction. Then, we of course have to systematize. If we just look at living versus inanimate, that doesn't yet give us ethics. We have to systematize, conceptualize, define life, value, etc., and then set it out deductively. Once we've reached the key definitions and principles, we need to organize it deductively, as we saw. So of course the deduction is critical. But the point is the deduction merely organizes and structures the essential points that were reached by observation and induction. Otherwise, there's no answer to the question, where did the definitions that we're using in our deduction come from? So I don't want to derogate deduction. Proper role is mind-body integration. But I do want to take the emphasis off of deduction as the primary cognitive process. <clears throat> because we have to combat rationalism. Therefore, I would say, uh, putting it in an extreme statement, the essential process of knowledge is not from principles, but to principles. So both schools, empiricists and rationalists, are wrong. But rationalists are catastrophically wrong uh, on this topic because they disdain the essential element of the process of human knowledge. <clears throat> now I want to say something about the validity of induction. The so-called problem of induction and the objectivist solution. Now, I'd like to point out that there is a solution, by the way. It is known. This is not an unresolved issue, contrary to some questions that I periodically get. 
in the male. There is nothing further to wait for as to the solution to the problem of induction. I do not say that there aren't details and aspects of the question unresolved. As induction applies to complex scientific procedures. For instance, there are tricky questions, at least tricky in my state of ignorance, on the issue of theory construction in physics. How do you choose among competing theories, both of which seem to explain all the known facts, etc.? There are some tricky questions in technical methodology of science, which of course I'm not going to try to address in this general lecture. But my point is this, as induction is employed by people as opposed to by physicists, in other words, in daily life and in philosophy, let me stress, and in philosophy there is no unresolved problem of induction. Now let me now indicate briefly. <clears throat> so this is a little excursion from rationalism versus empiricism, but I can't resist this because there is a myth abroad that this is an unresolved problem. First of all, of course, we can dismiss David Hume because his alleged problem uh, is completely unwarranted. His uh, problem of induction, that, as he bequeathed it, was based on the idea that cause and effect is a myth. And if so, of course, you really have a tremendous problem of induction. Why should the sun rise tomorrow just because it did yesterday if there's no reason in the world why it rose yesterday? But of course, if there are causal laws, if there are absolute principles in reality, if entities do act according to their nature, then you can know that the entity with this nature in the same circumstances will act the same way in the future. So there's no problem with cause and effect on that level uh, if you have a metaphysics of cause and effect. But that is not the total answer. Because even if we grant that there are cause and effect laws in reality, <clears throat> the question becomes how do you know when you have correctly discovered such a law? Obviously, in any induction, we cannot be exhaustive. By exhaustive, I mean separately observe first every instance under the principle. You couldn't, for example, study every example of man to determine that he's mortal. Among other things, you'd have to wait till all of us died, including yourself. And what about all the men still to come? So you have to take, or you couldn't study every example of honesty to determine that it's beneficial. First of all, there's trillions that have long gone that you could never come in contact with, etc. You have to take a sample of instances and then generalize to a universal conclusion that goes far beyond your sample. You must gather concretes and then at a certain point, to use the conventional terminology, leap to an a generalization. That's called the so-called inductive leap, about which philosophers make tremendous fuss. How can you justify it? When do you know, in effect, this leap is justified? And I really have a principle here. Now, I could give this to you in uh, many, many lectures, or very few words, and I'm choosing the second. My answer to this question is two words, <coughs> of which I will say some elaboration. Integration and delimitation. That obviously needs some explanation. Now let's take first integration. You know that in, in any induction, we have to begin by observation of concretes. We have to enumerate instances. We obviously need a number of instances. How many, which is the way some people put the question. And I would say in answer to that, you cannot possibly give a quantifiable answer. You cannot say the number you need 
to justify your conclusion is 3,809. When you have that, go ahead and leave. In some cases, 3,000 is not enough. And in other cases, four is a superfluity. You don't need that many. What determines? That is where integration comes up. Integration with what? With other knowledge that you possess. We induce in some context a newborn baby on the table, smacked by the doctor, does not generalize. First, he has to conceptualize, he has to observe, distinguish, separate, etc. You have to accumulate a tremendous amount of observational knowledge and implicit definitions before you can begin to induce. And my point is here that your induction has to be guided by all of the already accumulated knowledge. However primitive, it has to be integrated with what is already known. How many instances, therefore, you require in connection with a given generalization depends on the rest of your knowledge. Take the obvious example. We see, let us say, a thousand white swans, and we never come across an exception. We're in some country, let us say, where we've never seen a non-white swan. This would be unjustified, even from thousands of examples. With nothing further, you would be unjustified to generalize. It would be shaky, unconvincing uh, to conclude all swans are white. Why? Because if your knowledge has been developing normally, you have presumably observed that color is generally a non-essential, that it's a superficial attribute with little connection to the structure, nature, or actions of a given species. You can see that in human beings, which range from red, black, white, etc., and yet are all still human. Once you see this across many species, you already have a principle to guide you with regard to the swan, which is be suspicious. Do not assume that 10,000 cases proves anything because it's only color. That other knowledge, in other words, if you integrate your observation of the swans to it, in this case would undercut, undermine, jeopardize your potential generalization. On the other hand, all men are mortal. Now there, you may only have observed a thousand or a hundred, but it integrates with a tremendous amount of other observations. You know that it integrates with what you observe about all living beings in all categories, ages, animal, vegetable, plants, whatever the climate, the region, etc. There is a powerful mass of data with which you can integrate this observation, which immensely strengthens it. Now, that is not, by the way, the only integration. Integration has to be with everything you know that would be relevant. For instance, I had an interesting discussion with Ms. Rand once in which she said that if there were no aging process, even if everything else remained the same, she would be much less secure in the generalization that all men are mortal. Suppose, for instance, she hypothesized this pedagogically the following. Everything is the same. Every man, in fact, has actually died, and is true of all living beings, but there is no aging process. All we observe is that we're entirely healthy, strong, young, etc., and then bang, for no reason we drop dead. As against the present situation, where you see the gradual atrophy and the gray hair and the lines and the stooped oil, and the thing is obviously beginning to fall apart. <laughs> now, the aging process connects us. The mortality that we observe to something about the nature of the entity. It's another kind of fact that we see in all of the entities that integrates with the mortality, and it therefore gives support to the mortality. That's another set of observational inductive facts which support 
the mortality by integrating them with what we know. Now, observe that we're not omniscient. So there's no use asking me, well, but do you know what causes aging? Maybe we don't. Even if the facts of aging are not yet explained, even if our knowledge is limited, which it always is, it remains true that the new integration adds weight to the fact that men are mortal, and vice versa. The fact that we observe men are mortal adds weight to the fact that they're going to go on aging. Each one supports the other, because the two together, integrated, give us a fuller picture of living organisms and what their nature is. And of course, we can tie in further. We know that all entities, the inanimate included, wear out, that you can't expend energy in perpetuity, that machines ultimately collapse and turn into rubble, etc. And we can make an obvious connection to uh, living organisms. Now, these are scientific, not philosophic examples. I just want to give you an indication here that the solution to induction does not lie in sheer quantity. You have to have some instances, otherwise you're just rationalistically making it up out of the blue. But the crucial thing is the relation of your uh, instances to the other information that you have. Now, someone is sure to say, though I must cover this, this is an aside within an aside, well, isn't the whole thing circular? As I have um, presented it. Because after all, I say, just to take that example, the knowledge that man is mortal is strengthened, is established by the tie into aging. And the conviction that aging will go on is based on, or partly based on, the observation of mortality. So do we have an infinite regress, or what? How, how can you use A to strengthen B, which then in turn strengthens A? And is not this a circle? Now, the best simple answer to this is yes, it is circular. You may as well call a spade a spade. But this does not mean it's a logical fallacy. Let's say there's bad circularity and good circularity. In bad circularity, the kind that is a logical fallacy, you assert an arbitrary claim and then use it allegedly to prove itself. For instance, I say this is bad circularity. I am infallible. You say, what's the proof? And I say, well, Jim said so. And you say, well, why trust him? And you say, well, I know he's right and I'm infallible. Now there I'm just going in a circle. I arbitrarily assert something and then I use it to establish itself. Now in, in the induction, as I've been discussing it, to begin with, your initial statement is not arbitrary. It's based on a fund of observed concretes, which are independent of the integration. You actually observe men dying, or men aging, or whatever it happens to be. And the second step is an actual integration. You are not simply reasserting an arbitrary claim and using it to establish itself. You are connecting what you observe to everything else that you know. You're not merely uniting it to itself, which is what uh, deductive circularity is. So its induction is circular only in the sense that each element of the total supports the others and vice versa. Now, there is no fallacy in this. It truly is integration, making a whole, and a whole in which each part implies the rest and supports the rest. So the so-called circularity here is really an expression of the mutual interrelationships of parts within a whole. And this is essential to knowledge. And we have seen that throughout this uh, course. For instance, when we established that force is evil, we didn't just quit. We then had to integrate it to all the other virtues. Remember that whole thing we went through of how do you relate it to self-esteem and how do you relate it to honesty and et cetera and so on. 
And all of that integration strengthened the conviction that force is evil. And the conviction that force is evil, in turn, shed light on all of these other concretes and strengthened our knowledge of them. Now this is, uh, this if you call it circularity, is the essence of what integration is. If you remember our hierarchy exercise, each level led to the next and enabled us to grasp it, but the next in turn made the early one clearer, fuller, richer, more concretized. Uh, so don't be afraid of what's called mutually propping up uh, knowledge. Each element props up the others, and what is carried on is uh, the total. This, this is throughout knowledge. It's really what we mean by the spiral issue. Now you see how integration would apply. I've already mentioned it with regard to force in philosophic notes. Take the issue of honesty. Assuming we have the right context, how many examples did we need? Not very many. We certainly don't need hundreds and thousands of examples. A few. Because after a few, if we have the right context, we see the principle right away. A man trying to survive in defiance of reality in a specific way, and we already have all the other knowledge, which is what our context is, that we can integrate this too. We know already rationality was essential. We see ration, uh, honesty connects to this. It ties into all the other things we've already established. So only a few instances is necessary to validate uh, the induction, because the essence of the in induction is then to connect it to everything we already know about the nature of man, what he requires to survive, the nature of rationality. The observations, in effect, suggest a principle. The principle then integrates with a wealth of other observations already conceptualized, all of it ultimately giving us a fuller picture of the nature of the acting entity. Now you see here, parenthetically, why induction uh, requires proper definitions. I'm just getting a plug in for proper definitions because I've been more or less hostile to definitions as an attempt to counter rationalism. But for instance, if you define man as the rational animal, that's OK. And then when you say, well, why honesty is necessary, it ties right back to, well, this is what a rational being needs to survive. But suppose you define man as the entity with a thumb, which is also supposedly distinctive. And then you come now to integrate your observations about honesty. There is nothing, obviously, to tie it to. Why should a thumbed creature be harmed by disdaining reality. There's just no, nothing to grease the integration, you see. So you see the situation. The right definitions, which are themselves a product of observation and induction, become the peg for future induction. And those future inductions strengthen the earlier definitions, which in turn strengthen the induction. Now that's what I want to say about integration. And my other point was delimitation. Proper induction must always be delimited. <coughs> Our knowledge is always delimited. It's always specific. We always acquire knowledge within a certain framework of what we know and what we don't know. And what would be a good word starting with C? For everything we already know relevant to a given item that conditions our coming to that conclusion. Context. In other words, an inductive conclusion has to be preceded, always by the understood clause with in the knowledge so far acquired, within the context of what we already know, then man is mortal, honesty is life promoting, force is destructive of the mind, etc. In other words, our induction has to carry with it a specification, a delimitation. We're always saying, taking into account 
all of our observations, definitions, cognitions, inductions, etc. so far, this is our generalization. Do we know everything? Obviously not. So our induction are not rationalist dogmas. They are not revelations expressive of omniscience. They are not, you know, out of context intrinsicist bolts that are engraven uh, in the sky. So the rationalists are wrong. Does this mean, therefore, that our inductions are uncertain, uh, as the empiricists would say? No. And here I'll just state flatly and uh, illustrate this later this evening. Here the point is, later knowledge never contradicts earlier knowledge, not if the earlier knowledge was acquired by the right method. All it does is specify the conditions of the earlier knowledge. And this I'm going to discuss when we get to point four. So my point is this. Induction is perfectly valid and unproblematic. Its essence is integration within a specified context. And I have a bad mouthful here that would summarize it all. If you can say the following about a statement, about an inductive generalization, it is valid. I hesitate to dictate this because it is a ragged, wordy sentence. But this is it. Within the knowledge now possessed, this principle, suggested by concretes, integrates with everything known, particularly with essentials, as now defined, and contradicts nothing. And if you can say that, the generalization is valid. <laughs> Within the context now known, this generalization which was actually based on observed concrete, integrates with everything, particularly with essentials, and contradicts nothing. If you can say that, it's valid. <coughs> now, practically speaking, of course, putting it negatively, it means, again, that the most the, the wrong thing you can do is compartmentalize, because the essence of integration is, uh, of induction, is connection, union with the rest of knowledge. And you see why both rationalists and, and empiricists are therefore necessarily suspicious of induction, because both of them are inveterate compartmentalizers. And consequently, they have no way of knowing whether their generalizations are valid. And therefore, they regard it as precarious, uncertain, unreliable. And the empiricist says, OK, I'll go with the uncertainty. And the rationalist says, let's get rid of it. Now, just to finish off this topic of induction and deduction, for uh, rationalists focusing on deduction, the model is math of human cognition. For uh, empiricists, as we've seen, the model is some sort of sprawling, unstructured science like statistics. For objectivism, the model is what? There is no model. All sciences properly performed are in the same boat, except for mathematics and logic, which are untypical for reasons which we've already discussed. Knowledge does not consist of picking out some sub subject which you feel warmly toward and then modeling all the rest of your knowledge on that. Philosophy sets the terms, the principles, to govern all cognition. But even it is not a good model of all cognition, even though philosophy does unite the abstract and the concrete, or induction and deduction. It is nevertheless also untypical. It's extremely abstract. It does not engage in experimentation, so it's not typical either. You cannot approach cognition by modeling on some subject. You have to approach it by principle. All right, let's go to point three. You'll be happy to know these are the longest points, one and two. 
And this is the objectivist view of axioms. <coughs> Well, of course, they exist. They're important. We have to spe specify them. To that extent, rationalists are right. Empiricists are wrong. But as against rationalism, axioms, according to objectivism, are preconditions of knowledge. They are not the starting points of a deductive development. They are not the foundations by which, from which we infer conclusions, a la mathematics. The three axioms of objectivism, for example, existence, consciousness, identity, are not starting points from which you can deduce conclusions. If all you know is existence exists and you sit and stare at that, you will never get any further. That's it. You'll just say it over and over till you're done. Those axioms are the foundations of knowledge, which means they enable us then to look at reality, to have actual experience, which we then have to conceptualize, induce, integrate, etc. So the rationalists are right. There are fundamentals which are important. There is a hierarchy, but the point is the true fundamentals are not our deductive starting points, and above all, the true fundamentals are on the perceptual level. That's the other main difference from rationalism. The only self-evident, the only starting point is direct perception. There is no so-called conceptual self-evidency, a la Leibniz or the rationalist. Now, the don't be confused by A is A, which is a, an abstract statement, but it's simply an abstract statement of a perceptual self-evidence. Now, you see, the rationalist poses as a champion of hierarchy, fundamentals, but in fact, he starts with arbitrary starting points and ends up disregarding true fundamentals and even opposing them, as Leibniz, for instance, end up opposing the material world. The whole idea of fundamentals in a hierarchical structure implies that we start our hierarchy with what we learn by observation, and that the more sophisticated is based on that. Therefore, to hammer this point home again, definitions are not axioms. They are not starting points of cognition, but conclusions. as we've said over and over. Reasoning does not consist of starting with definitions and avoid. Definitions are actually, as we've said, inductive conclusions. They're crucial, but they are not the beginning of knowledge. Now, it is very important to know when something is an axiom and when it isn't. You can take a true principle, something which is actually the case, but if you falsely take it as an axiom in your thinking, it will wreak havoc by the sheer fact that you took it as an axiom, even though it's absolutely true. It makes all the difference to how you think with that principle, whether it's an axiom or itself a conclusion resting on a lot of other information. Now, let's take, for instance, as an example of this, <clears throat> the principle that controls breed control. Now, that's true. Once a government starts controls, those controls are going to cause dislocations, which they have to rectify by other controls, and so on, so the process grows forever. Now, suppose in your thinking, you let it function as an axiom. In other words, a starting point. To you, that's simply self-evident. You just look out, you see controls go. That's an obvious point. I'm going to take that as my axiom. Now, a starting point means it does not require proof. Obviously, it doesn't. It's an axiom. It doesn't require a context. It's just, that's it. That's where I begin. 
The beginning doesn't require a context. It's the beginning. You can't have a context until you get started. Well, how will you start to think now with this principle, controls breed controls, which is, mind you, true? Well, the only obvious conclusion would have to be, I guess, dictatorship is inevitable then. Because controls breed control. That's my beginning. We got lots of controls, so they're going to breed more controls and more controls and so on. The end has to be dictatorship. If you say to such a person, how would you explain the American Revolution, for instance? There's a lot of controls, and that bred a revolution. So you can think controls bred freedom. Well, that will simply be inconceivable to someone on this approach who takes it as an axiom. Or else it'll plunge them in chaos, and their conclusion will be, you see, you never can trust a principle. Some empiricists will always find an exception. Now, the reason we, you get into these kind of snarls is because controls breeds control is not an axiom. It's a derivative, which means it has already a whole context, and it applies only in that context. It's not a primer. Controls lead to controls. How and why and in what way? Well, they lead to crises. They can lead to some people being sacrificed for others, so they have to have pressure groups. And the pressure groups rebel against being scapegoats, so they come in and they demand more controls if they're to survive and so on. And all of that will take place assuming that nobody tells them there's an alternative philosophy, as, for instance, was said in the American Revolution. So in the appropriate context, if you see the proof, the context will leap out at you, then the principle is true. But if you start with it as an axiom, you, by that fact, lose everything on which it depends, and you are lost. Now, by the way, this is why there is no context for a true axiom. You do not say, within the framework of what we already know, A is A. You do not say that, because until you say A is A, you can't open your mouth to say within the framework. You don't know anything until you know A is A, and that conditions all subsequent knowledge. A true axiom is just there. There's nothing whatever to say about how it applies, or when it applies, or how you get to it. You just look, and that's it. So to take something improperly as an axiom is to treat it as though it was like A is A. Now, if you want another example of this, I just refer you to an article by Harry Binswanger, uh, the title and date of which I can't remember. But he analyzes the libertarians who take the principle that it's evil to initiate force. But they take that as an axiom, instead of as the conclusion of a very long and complex approach to ethics and philosophy. And he analyzes very acutely how there is literally no way to know how to interpret or apply that principle if you start with it as your axiom. So I would refer you to that as simply another example. Now, while we are on the topic of axioms, I want to say a word about monism and pluralism. And I think the best thing to say is they're both wrong. Pluralism, you remember that was the typical empiricist approach, a la the five causes of Nazism or whatever. Pluralism is the failure to conceptualize. It's being concrete. By it. That's obviously, to, to insist on that as a desirable state is obviously to make a virtue out of mindlessness. But monism as such is also wrong. And I mean by monism here, the insistence that the explanation must always be one principle. Now, I think the truth is you have to go by reality without numerical preferences. If, in fact, there are many irreducible causes of a phenomenon, you cannot say, but there must be one. That would be, in effect, Pythagoreanism. One is my lucky number, and it's got to hold true. Now we can go this far with rationalism. You can have a general predilection for monism. 
In other words, you should say, I'm always going to try to see whether I can find one unifying cause. Because that amounts to saying, try to abstract. Don't be content with the plurality unless that's the way the facts actually are. So you can sympathize with the rationalist attempt, but you can only carry it out within the framework of the possible. Very often, you can find a unifying principle. As, for instance, you can find a, defi a definition of man, one principle. Or you can find a principle governing human history, the role of philosophy. But many times, to my knowledge, you cannot. Take such a thing, for instance, as crime. Is there one cause of crime? Well, crime covers everything from arson and pickpocketing to andropop. Maybe there are essentially different phenomena subsumed under this one concept. I don't know. I've never studied it. The point is, you cannot insist a priori that because there's one term, there must be one cause. You have to study the actual phenomenon. Another example would be psychosis. Perhaps that under the things, after all, in our primitive present stage of knowledge, perhaps under the term psychosis, we subsume many different, essentially different conditions. Maybe uh, involutional melancholia and paranoid schizophrenic are not really two variants of one essential. Now, this would be an issue for scientific study. I certainly sympathize with the attempt to try to find some unifying explanation, but I don't think you can insist on it. Now, while we were on the topic of axioms, we mentioned briefly the issue of determinism versus indeterminism. So let me, in a word, cover objectivism on that. The best way to call the objectivist position, I think, is self-determinism. It's obviously not determinism. We believe in free will. You have the choice to think or not. And that, in a turn, determines your actions, your emotions, and so on. So there are laws of human psychology. There are principles we can gather. Indeterminism is obviously also wrong. There is cause and effect. It's unbreached. Free will is not a violation of cause and effect. It's a form of causality. So the best way to describe the objectivist position is not. Everything is inevitable. There's no choice. Or there is no law. The world is chance. The world is law. Everything has a cause. but. In the case of human action, the cause is certain choices that we ourselves make that are free choices which govern the, the resulting stream of uh, events. And the best way to say, I guess, is everything about us is determined by our ultimate choices that we ourselves make. So let's call that self-determinism just for terminology. Now let's do. Point four, certainty. And here the objectivist position is certainty, yes. Omniscience, no. Certainty within a context. And let us now look at the point that induction can yield certainty if you delimit and specify the context. Now take the topic from my book, which I happen to be familiar with, The Cause of History. Now the thesis of the book, The Ominous Parallels, is completely a generalization. It's inductive. I'm saying something that's supposedly the cause of all historical phenomena. Now the method is to observe concretes, two countries, and then to observe all the different or many of the different concrete aspects of life in each country. Economics, politics, art, literature, science, etc. In each case, 
I try to bring out by analysis an underlying factor. Philosophy. Philosophy in some form is shaping this and this and this. Now, I don't have a great deal of quantity. Only two countries, both from the modern era. Uh, and yet, I come into a generalization at the end, which applies to all history. Now, that is obviously a big inductive leap. What permits it? An implicit integration, going along with what we said before. I also bring in a certain view of the nature of man, which itself rests on earlier inductions, that man survives by the use of reason. That's a generalization acquired earlier, not argued for in my book. That reason requires a certain guidance, knowledge of the nature of the universe, of knowledge of values, in other words, a certain philosophic guidance that the implication of philosophy has, therefore, tremendous power by the very nature of man. Now, this is a whole framework of principles that I bring to the historical observation. So I tie in, I integrate the observations about America and Germany in all the concretes with everything that I know that's relevant about the nature of man. That's where the integration comes in. Now, I want to stress but even so, this is a contextual issue. The rationalist would say, in effect, well, once you did all this, that's it. It's an absolute. You now just say, that's it. Philosophy is the cause of history. It's a dogma. You're omniscient. Of course, if and when then any exception would occur, an empiricist would clap his hands in glee and say, ah, you see, another theory bites the dust. Now, I want to, just for pedagogical purposes, suppose the worst, just to illustrate that it doesn't mean anything. Let's suppose there is an exception to the theory of history put forth in my book. Suppose centuries from now, we'll discover that there is a precondition to this law of human history that we do not yet know. I, obviously, since I don't know it, I can't tell you what it is. But let, let's make up a bizarre one, just for the heck of it. Let's suppose that philosophy is influential on human affairs only if men engage in sexual relations at least once a year. I never thought of that. <laughs> Everybody that I looked at had done that, so it just passed me by. I don't know why that would be, but let's say. And that if they are abstinent for very long periods, philosophy no longer has any power. Well, would that invalidate the thesis? Would it wipe out all the observations that led to it? Obviously not. They are all there. They're all true. They're all vital. But the point would be, we now learn that they hold only under a certain condition that we hadn't earlier identified. They hold only in a certain context. And now we've discovered a new condition. So the rationalist is wrong. You have to say inductive knowledge can always be made more precise. You can always specify more fully what it depends on. It is not a dogma, a revelation. Does this mean, then, that we should always say, well, how do you know? Maybe there's going to be a new condition next week or next century. Is it possible? Do I have to, every time I utter a generalization, say, well, I, I'm not a dogmatist, therefore I have to add conscientiously, it's possible this is going to be overthrown or specified or whichever at a later time. No. Only where there's a specific basis to say it's possible. What you should say is, so-and-so is certain within the framework of all the knowledge already obtained. You should not say, it is impossible to discover anything new that's relevant. You should not say, it is possible to discover something new that's relevant. You do not have to say either if you don't have any basis to say either. The proper thing is wait. 
be content with what you have, be alert, do not hypothesize the future if you don't know, if you have no basis. Go with the evidence. And if you do that, you will be entirely confident on the framework of what you do know. And if and when the worst so-called happens, it does not threaten what you already know. New knowledge does not invalidate old knowledge. It will not upset your inductions if, of course, they were made by complete integration uh, in the first place. So you, you don't have to worry uh, about this question. The rationalists are right that certainty is essential. But they are wrong in thinking that omniscience is the means to it. The empiricists are right that we're not omniscient, but they are wrong in thinking that therefore we have to dispense with induction. The solution is certainty within a specified context. All right, let's take a short break. All right, I want to uh, continue this list of points, but the major points have already been made, so I'm going to zip through uh, these last ones in a sketchy way. <coughs> I think they are implicit from what we've already said and from the last two classes. Point five, the objectivist attitude to order or system. Obviously, yes, we are in favor of order or system as against empiricism, but not an order or system allegedly dictated by reality without reference to our minds. An order or system based on the facts and the nature of our consciousness. And therefore, there are options a certain range of options within the proper order or system. There's options in the order of learning originally and in the order of organizing or presenting once you've already learned. As to the order of learning, we've already covered the fact that there is no necessary uh, order. You don't have to learn the concept table before chair, or the virtue of integrity before the virtue of independence. Whenever you have concretes under a given abstraction, they're all simultaneous in reality, and therefore there are many options in um, acquiring the knowledge. There are, of course, principles of structure, of order, as we know from our hierarchy exercise certain broad issues that have to precede others and make the learning possible. And this order you must follow. But that does not dictate every detail. So both rationalism and empiricism are wrong. Rationalism is saying there are no options. Empiricism is saying that everything is an option. There are options within the framework of principles dictated by reality. The same is true for organizing or presenting material already learned. There are many choices or options in a lecture, an article, or just in reviewing and thinking in your own mind. There is no one to say you must give concretes first and then the abstraction, or vice versa. There is no one to say you must first give the lesser principles and then the broader, or vice versa. There are many options as against the rationalists. But against the empiricists, certain logic is necessary. You do have to make clear in some form what the key abstractions are and what their logical relationship is. Point six. Emotions. This is the subject of next week's lecture. The objective is view of emotions in contrast to rationalism and empiricism. So I simply will indicate in a word here, the rationalist is the repressor, opposed to emotions, 
And in contrast to that, objectivism is strongly in favor of emotions, feelings, because those, of course, are the expression of values. Objectivism, if it's anything at all, is a philosophy of self-interest. And self-interest has to involve, as a crucial precondition or constituent, I want X. That means having a feeling and asserting. Now, as against empiricism, however, objectivism is not emotionalism. It is not the whim-worshipping idea of Nietzsche, that if you feel it, that makes it right. Well, this we're going to discuss next time with lots of detail. Point seven. Polemics. <clears throat> First on the topic of the need of polemics. <clears throat> if you hold your philosophy in a chewed form, concretely related to reality, you will not feel vulnerable or threatened by disagreement. It doesn't mean, of course, you can answer every objection. There are tremendously ingenious people coming up with tremendously warped arguments. And uh, anybody can be thrown by something new, especially if they don't specialize in the field and they weren't expecting that particular nightmare. But I think what you can acquire is to get rid of an obsessive need to prove and prove and refute and refute. You will be, as they say in California, much more laid back. <laughs> in a situation where you judge it appropriate, you may want to argue and refute, but you won't have that need. I have to force him and beat him down, which is a consequence and an expression of a failure in the way your own ideas are held in your mind. That need is really a way of saying, I do know after all. I'm not as confused as I think I am. But if you know you know, you don't have to act it out. Now, with regard to the method of polemics, the proper method, In a word, it is reduce a dispute to basic premises. In other words, don't focus on internal inconsistency of your opponent, ally the rationalist. And don't merely cite random facts at him, ally the empiricist. Recognize that his viewpoint rests on a certain foundation, and the only way to attack that foundation is through facts. If you recognize that it rests on a foundation, you will be attacking the empiricist approach, because you will be going to the structure of his argument. If you recognize that you have to cite facts, you will be attacking a rationalist method. A brief example, but just a schematic one, because I don't want to take the time to go into it. Let's take three right-wing people trying to refute socialism. Now, a rationalist will typically argue like this. Well, you claim to be for freedom, which all socialists do. But actually, you lead to complete dictatorship, so you're contradicting yourself. You're for your ledger for freedom, and yet we have no choice at all under your system. That's the attempt to show that he's internally inconsistent. And of course, the typical socialist, if he studied Hegel, simply comes back and says, it looks to you like you're not free, but really there's true freedom for the real self under socialism. It's just the ephemeral, superficial self that goes to jail. So it doesn't phase him. The empiricist tries to refute socialism by simply random brute facts. He listens to it and he says, well, that's all fine, but look, they're starving in Russia. He doesn't bother why are they starving, that's just it. Who can explain anything? He just tosses a fact trying to obliterate a theory. And this, of course, uh, cuts no weight because the socialist says there's 10,000 reasons why they are 
uh, poor in Russia. They've had bad leadership. They've had terrible weather for 57 years, etc. <laughs> Now, the objectivist approach, again, just schematically, is in principle, you cannot argue against socialism except by reference to its foundation. And by foundation, you don't have to go all the way back to A to Z. You have to go back, in effect, to altruism. That is the ethical root which the socialist is actually counting on and which his, which his politics expresses. And then you have to explain, in effect, this is the thing to argue about, not politics. This is what the issue is. I say now, look at the facts. Man has a certain nature. He has to live egoistically. If he doesn't, if he does what you do and he sacrifices himself, then he has to give up his freedom. He has to give up his prosperity, etc. You take the data which the rationalist and the empiricist sees on out of context and you show that it follows from the uh, foundation. That's very brief. That gives you just a, an angle of approach. And now the last point. What is, there's hardly any suspense on this, what is the philosophic foundation of this whole approach that we've been presenting this evening? It is not the intrinsicist view, it is not the subjectivist view, but the objective view. That's the foundation. The whole thing in all of these separate points is we are trying to know reality by a certain means by using our consciousness, which has a certain nature and dictates a certain method. We have to adhere to the direct concretes out there, the percepts, but we have to grasp them by using concepts, abstractions. We have to unite the facts, reality, as grasped by our mind. And if you remember the discussion of objectivity, that is exactly the opposite of either the intrinsicist view that we wait for revelations or the subjectivist view that we're cut off from reality. Now, every one of these points, reality makes a contribution in our consciousness. For instance, reality gives us the absolutes, but our consciousness says they are contextual. We only learn them within a certain framework of knowledge. Reality dictates the structure of our system but our consciousness includes that it's volitional, so we have options and implementation. Reality says you must go by reason and adhere to facts, and our consciousness includes, but we have to evaluate and emotionally respond to facts, and there has to be a place for emotion. If you went down the list, you'd see that throughout, it's always an expression of adherence to reality by a consciousness of a certain kind, so that the root of the whole objectivist approach is what we've been calling the objective as against the intrinsic or the subjective. And this is perhaps the deepest reason why the whole philosophy is called objectivism to begin with, because it dictates the whole approach to cognition. All right, now I draw a line, because I want to get to a different topic tonight. I want to turn to one of the arguments that we discussed in the opening lecture. Actually, I believe it was the third argument that we gave. And we'll do the second one next week, uh, or the first one next week, and the second in the last lecture. And this was the argument, what is the use of philosophy or objectivism in daily life? You recall the argument, as I presented it, the person says, well, I see that philosophy is important when you're a teenager, when you're starting your career, so to speak, in life because it gives you a basic direction. But after you're established and you have a political affiliation and a career and 
a lifestyle, and so on. What then is the use or value of philosophy? Now, I'm putting the answer to this argument in this lecture because I would say the whole argument depends on how philosophy is held in a person's mind. If a person holds it either rationalistically or empiricistically, in other words, if he holds philosophy as floating abstractions, this argument is compelling. It's convincing. It's valid. Floating abstractions, by definition, have no applications. If uh, philosophy is just a generalized ritual, that like what Ms. Rand called church on Sundays, that you recite every once in a while, then of course it has no connection to daily life. Then we could put that, the point this way. If ideas have no connection to concretes, they have no connection to life. That's the real point here. But on the other hand, if the principles are held in chewed, concretized, reality-oriented form, if there's simply your way of holding a mass of data, if they are your means of grasping, judging, evaluating concrete, then they are absolutely indispensable to living, and you can't get on without them. The whole thing hinges on how you hold philosophic uh, ideas. Well, let's take some specific cases. Where does philosophy come up in daily life? And why does it come up? Assuming now you're past the teenage stage. Well, I'm going to leave out politics. I'm leaving out the state of the world. Because philosophy is not only for politics, it is not primarily for politics. It is not primarily to equip you to argue with people. Even if there were no politics, or you were entirely apolitical, if you were uninterested in the whole subject, philosophy would still be vital to your daily life. So I'm not going to even utter anything about the role of philosophy and helping you understand the state of the world and fighting against today's trends. All of that should be obvious anyway. But it's not even worth discussing because that takes us off what the main point is. If politics should not be your primary tie to philosophy. If it is, you're missing the role of philosophy in life. <clears throat> now this argument that we're considering begins with the idea, well, I had a lot of choices when I was growing up, when I was on the threshold of maturity. But now I've settled them. I've made my basic decisions. The answer, in essence, is however much you have settled, resolved, decided, there is still a tremendous amount in any life that is not routine and not automatically settled. Everyone is continuously confronted by novelty, by the need to choose, the need to judge, the need to come to new conclusions, the need to evaluate. You simply cannot escape this if you are a human being living. So you have to do it somehow. It's the only thing is, how do you do it? And the point I'm going to argue for is however you do it, you are going to be acting on some philosophic point. It's only a question of do you know it and do you approve it? Now the whole thing here rests on concrete examples. So let's take, for instance, your self-evaluation. I could start anywhere, but for the heck of it, let's take that as the main example. Your evaluation of yourself. Nobody can escape the continuous need to evaluate himself. Am I good, bad, successful, or a failure? Efficacious, 
impractical, etc. As you know, you cannot escape having a need for self-esteem or failing that pseudo-self-esteem. Something to keep you going with the idea, I have some value. Now, how are you going to, in practice, satisfy this need? Now, you see that you cannot say, well, I already have my self-esteem. I reached it when I was 18. I decided I was good, so who needs values and philosophy, etc.? I, I answered that question. You cannot do it, even if you would like to. Because 10,000 circumstances will arise, not only can, but will arise, to challenge or shake whatever estimate you came to. If you do not have principles to protect yourself, principles that you know and righteously, deliberately, consciously apply. Now take an example. You're at work. Think you're doing okay, the season for a raise comes around and you don't get one. You were ignored. No explanation was offered. Now, a typical state of affairs. Obviously, there are certain all kinds of questions here. However much of a routine you're in, you can't avoid wondering why. Was my work good? Is the boss fair? Is this an injustice? Did I deserve to be passed over? Are my co-workers against me? Have they been agitating against me? Do they dislike me? What does this prove about me? Now, you can't avoid a dozen questions of this kind. Suppose you just say, well, look, to hell with it. I have my... Uh, Conclusions long ago, my fundamental conclusions established. I'm not going to think about this at all. I'm set on my course. I'm just going to go ahead. If so, your automatic functions are simply going to take over. And they can go entirely by chance. You have no way then of controlling them. They may go anyway. For instance, you may decide, I'm not thinking about this. And the dominant emotional sum is you will resent the way you're treated. Maybe rightly or wrongly, but you don't analyze. You're not for all this moralism. So uh, you just feel resentful. Then you get carried into becoming defensive. And whether you like it or not, the feeling occurs to you, the boss is a swine, my co-workers are swine, nobody appreciates me, life is hell. So you end up some version of the malevolent universe. Or you may, your subconscious may move you in a completely different direction. You may be shaken by this experience. You may begin to feel fear. You, see? you just let it coast. You just let it go. And you say, you begin to feel, I'm no good. I deserve to fail. I'm worthless. They were right to do what they did. And you start to get depressed miserable, or you have no particular emotion, neither anger nor fear, you just feel baffled, and you just ride it, that's all. And you begin to feel life is puzzling, which to you it certainly is, because you've got no answers. <laughs> Who can understand anything? Life is just brute chance. And after a little while of that, not surprise me if your ambition begins to fade. Who can try or do anything if life is just a chaos or anything can happen? Whatever you do, if you simply coast, has disastrous consequences on your life and on your routine. It attacks your motivation, your relations with others, your hope, the degree of effort you put forth and your very self-estimate, which was supposed to be impregnable and part of your settled routine. Now contrast that with going to the same situation consciously by principle. In effect, you tell yourself, either at the beginning or at some point, I know the universe can be dealt with, 
So I'm not opening the question of, is life hell? I know that self-esteem should be based on what you do and can't be at the mercy of other people's uh, opinions. I know that the world is intelligible, and I won't accept such a conclusion as, who knows, everything is chaos. The sheer act of reiterating those obviously philosophic principles in that context already acts to abort all kinds of self-destructive automatic uh, reactions. And that's just the beginning of the role of philosophy. It's like a guardian. Every time you try to think about this question even more specifically, you are counting on philosophic standards. If you're trying to think, was my work good, let's say. Well, what do you mean by good? By what standard? How much can you properly expect of yourself? Suppose you catch yourself feeling, well, somehow I should have done better. I shouldn't have made that mistake last week. Now, that in itself could lead you to start having self-doubt. But suppose you then were philosophical and you say to yourself, well, look, I know that human knowledge is limited that we can't expect revelations, that's intrinsicism, and I have to come to conclusions on the basis of what I know, and I can make mistakes, I can't blame myself for it. You're bringing epistemology into what do you define as good work? Have you got impossible or rational standards? Or should you have been given an explanation? What does that mean? Well, maybe you'll say, I'm no good. They don't even have to give me an explanation. But if you remember philosophy, you'll say, well, in this context, whatever else is true, they should have been objective. It's not right for people to deal with one another without giving them an explanation of something crucial which one does that affects another in a joint enterprise. That's philosophy. That's the application of a broad principle in your particular situation. Do other people dislike you? You start to think about that. Well, it's very relevant to ask, are they right or wrong to dislike you? What standards do they use? What standards should they use? That's philosophy. Suppose, for instance, you don't play poker with them. Well, should you take the blame for that or what? Now, you see, there are dozens of issues involving your knowledge of what is justice? What is objectivity? What is the role of context? What is the nature of the universe? Et cetera, et cetera. All of which are absolutely essential to coming out of this type of situation alive, healthy, and functioning rather than in a self-destructive way. If you just let it go by and say, I'm already set, your philosophy will not automatically apply itself. Even if you think it will, what will happen is that the automatic functions will take over. And they do not automatically apply philosophy, merely the emotion of the moment. So what they do is whittle away whatever principles you once did uh, accept. If you suddenly find yourself thinking it's hopeless to deal with other people, it's all subjective, they'll never understand me. As soon as you say that, you should think, well, no, I know this is wrong. Value that's supposed to be objective. Therefore, communication of mutual appreciation is supposed to be possible. So I can't draw that conclusion. I mean, it just goes on and on. What a proper philosophy, what objectivism does give you, is the principles to judge and decide the actual concrete events of your life. It gives you the moral support when you're right and the guidance of how to change when you're wrong. And that is literally indispensable if you are not to be massacred by undirected automatic function. There's no other way out of it. Now, on this issue of giving you moral support when right, I asked, if you recall, people to hand in papers on uh, what was the role of objectivism in uh, their daily life. I had wanted to read long excerpts, but I'll read just a few brief ones because this was a good example. Someone gave an example of this. He said, quote, I've always been opinionated and enjoyed the realm of ideas. Since objectivism, both of these elements have been intensified, unquote. 
Now that's a good example of the role of philosophy, because suppose somebody criticizes you for being opinionated, or you're militantly anti-philosophical. Well, your subconscious may conclude, I shouldn't talk so much. After all, everybody wants to be liked. There's nothing whatever wrong about that. As long as you're liked for the right things. But how do you know what are the right things that you should be liked for? And whether this is a valid charge against you or not. Are you being criticized for your virtues or for a flaw? What are your virtues? What are virtues? You see, without philosophy, the sheer, let's put it this way, the complexities of life will whittle away whatever conviction you had, including whatever conviction you had in your own value. Who was it that said eternal vigilance is the price of liberty? Was that Jefferson or uh, Patrick Henry? Somebody famous. Anyway, eternal vigilance is the price of self-esteem. And the only method of vigilance is philosophic principles. There is literally no other way uh, to do it. Now, that is just one example. Uh, I mean, there's trillions of things that would come up beside your estimate of yourself that you have to judge. However routine you might think your life is, you meet new people. Or, however you restrict your social contacts so that you can coast on what you already conclude, old people periodically do unexpected things. Sometimes much worse than you could have imagined, and sometimes much better. You constantly have to uh, decide, judge, evaluate. Other people are irrational. What is being irrational? How do you know that's irrational, etc.? Evaluations imply some method of evaluating. Without philosophic principles, you're back to no way to judge except blindly. And I'm speaking now of judging other people. For instance, a friend lies to you, which happens. Now, suppose you just react by your automatic function. You say, I don't need philosophy. Well, you might be very upset that he lied to you. You feel it's bad. He is no good. He's out. Or, you might like the person a lot and feel, I don't care if he lied to me, he's my friend. Or you might feel, I don't know which way to go. I'll just evade the whole question. And then you simply feel shaken and uncertain about the guy. Now, all three of these methods are hopeless. You may cut off a true friend who lied absolutely innocently. Or you may fall into the power of someone really evil just because you felt you liked him. Or you may just end up in perpetual self-doubt and be afraid to like or dislike anybody because who knows? You cannot get out of it unless you say, well, how would you objectively judge this? The guy lied. What is the right conclusion? Well, what is the status of lying? What does morality say? And that is philosophy. And of course, philosophy would tell you there are different kinds of lies in different contexts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You either use philosophy or you put yourself on automatic pilot. And you put yourself on automatic pilot in cases where the pilot has not been programmed. And therefore, it is a disaster. Now, you see how this applies to millions of concretes, your estimate of movies, of books, of anything you go and see. Your friend disagrees with you when you go to see a movie. Should you argue? What does it mean? Does it show that he's really completely opposite to you and he's a no good person? Maybe everything is subjective. It's a hopeless to expect people to agree. Maybe there are options. Maybe on some things, you have to agree on the principles, but there are lots of room for disagreement. Is this such a case? Well, what are the principles? 
I mean, on even such a small thing as this, you either bring your philosophy consciously to bear or you just flounder helplessly. You can't escape some kind of philosophic conclusion, you see. If you overthrow philosophy, you're simply acting on it unconsciously, such as subjectivism, or malevolent universe, or whatever. You may, for instance, be an intrinsicist subjectivist, subjectively, unthinkingly, and you start to argue aggressively with this friend. You're wrong. I know this is a great movie. When in fact it may be entirely optional, there may be many different aspects. Now, we, I haven't even got to such a big topic as psychological problems. How can you solve them except basically through philosophy? I don't mean that that's the only thing. Obviously, electron philosophy, I hasten to add, will not solve psychological problems. I would never have any if it would. But what I would say is this, all attempts at self-improvement do involve philosophy as an essential ingredient. Because it involved in, in any attempt at self-improvement, you are using principles in the face of your automatized functions to the contrary. There's something about your reactions or whichever that you don't like. And the only way that you can change is every time you're tempted or every time the problem reasserts itself, you have to cling to the knowledge, the principle that tells you, whatever you feel now, it is still true that so-and-so is the case. So that your philosophic standards become the beacons enabling you to improve yourself, to grow, to correct your errors. This course in its own way is an example of that. Suppose you have a rationalist tendency, which you can certainly have without any evil, and you want to improve. How can you do it? only by grasping a correct philosophy and then deliberately applying it. Now, again, I repeat, that would not be enough. A rationalist probably would need psychotherapy if he's a really deep uh, rationalist, because there are psychological factors involved. And it's one thing to know the truth and another thing to be able to integrate it. But obviously, one essential element is you have to know the truth that you're aiming to integrate, that has to be clear and conscious. Philosophy, in effect, is what makes you a self-regulator as opposed to just a passive, helpless reactor. This non-philosophy approach or anti-philosophy approach amounts in practice to what philosophy? Pragmatism, right. Because what it practically amounts to is there are no principles. You don't have to integrate. You don't have to have any overview. You don't have to consider the long range. Just react to out of context concretes. And that means you have to gradually atrophy, lose control of your life, yourself, your knowledge of your friends, etc. It's the same issue that we discussed. Why do we need principle? Why do we even need ethics? Remember, we discussed in the nature of man why he needs conceptual guidance. And this is really the same issue. It's identically the same issue. Philosophy is that set of most fundamental principles required for guidance in every issue. Now, I'm not saying, and I'd like to stress this, in this big pitch for the role of philosophy in daily life, that the moral is that you have to become philosophers. No. Nor am I saying you have to spend your time thinking about it, writing papers, etc. No. Nor am I saying it's important to argue with people about it. This is not a social issue. I'm saying you have to keep your philosophy alive in your own mind as your life guide. You have to know in terms that you understand the principles that are going to guide you in all of these daily choices. And you have to be able to apply them in the countless situations where you have to choose, you need guidance, where you can't rely on your automatic functions. Now, I don't say you never can rely on your automatic functions. Obviously, if you could not rely on them, you'd be like a baby. You'd have to start everything from scratch. You go to work. 
you know, to sit down and analyze why am I starting to type? Uh, you know, what do I have to do in the trader principle and for my salary? That's all ridiculous. That's all automatized. There's no problem. You just carry it on. But the point is, life is not only rote routine. Uh, and you cannot make it that however you restrict your range, unless you just become catatonic and don't move at all. Now, you see, my argument does not refer to today's world specifically. It is not true. Well, this world today is so bad, we need to know a better view. But if you were brought up in an objectivist heaven, uh, who would need philosophy? That is not true. You would still have all the same questions, all the same choices to make. There would be still no way to judge or decide or keep on track except to go back to principle, which means philosophy. Now, if we had time, I would like to read you from some of the papers, because I thought some of them were very illuminating. So I want to just read from one, if I may. This is from a, a student in Canada who happened to hear the first lecture. Um, and uh, I like it because this is what I re regard as a proper scale of approach. This is philosophy for daily life, rather than for the ages you know, for the cause, for some kind of tremendous abstraction. And therefore, the homier, the smaller, the more folksy the example, the better. And therefore, I like this. He gave three cases where he used philosophy in daily life, which I'd like to read. One, I use philosophy when I'm buying a new pipe. When I walk into a pipe store, I don't just buy the first pipe that strikes my fancy. Because philosophy tells me that feelings are not tools of cognition. My liking a pipe doesn't make it a good one. It might get too hot when you smoke it. It might be improperly balanced or too heavy to hold between your teeth. It might cost too much. I choose a pipe by means of reason. If I find several pipes that meet my requirements, I can then safely pick the one that I like best. Philosophy doesn't stifle my feelings. It simply prevents me from wasting time and money on faulty pipes so I have more time to enjoy a good smoke. <laughs> now you see there, <clears throat> see that is really uh, the idea of the objective. There are many options within the correct principles. So that he's not taking a revelation that it has to be this one pipe, nor subjective, any pipe you feel like. You see? Now it goes on. Two, I use philosophy when I'm late for the bus. I'll run like hell to catch it, but if it's pulling away, I'll relax and light up my pipe. <laughs> <laughs> now, but he elaborates. Philosophy tells me the difference between the metaphysical and the man-made. If the bus is gone, there's nothing I can do to change it, and no use getting steamed up over it. I think philosophy helps prevent stress. It also tells me that I should change what is in my power, my alarm clock. <laughs> now then, his last point is more social, but still it's worth. The other day, philosophy sent a few hundred thousand people marching through the streets to protest the, quote, arms race. A different kind of philosophy convinced me to stay at home. My philosophy armed me against a pacifist I met at a party that night, and it told me when it was useless to argue any longer. I see that is the level, particularly points one and two, the pipe and the bus, that um, uh, is really very important to grasp because that is where philosophy comes in in daily life. If you hold philosophy in a form where that's the level that you apply it, you are safe. If you can do that, it means your philosophy is concretized, it's tied to reality, it's functioning as its purpose. And then you have. There's no worry. You will never give up your philosophy, because that'd be like giving up your eyesight. On the other hand, if you begin to feel, well, it's all broad abstractions, and I already know what my goal and what party I belong to, it has to mean ideas in your mind float. They have no connection to the actual concretes of your life. So this whole argument comes back to the issue, how do you hold ideas? Now, one student from this course gave what I thought was a very good summary of the role of objectivism 
in his life. I'll just quote one paragraph. He says, objectivism, uh, two analogies can be made. One is that objectivism is to me as my sense of life is to me. It's like a constant, ever-present awareness of myself and my goals. The other is that objectivism serves the same purpose to me as a work of art. It provides me with emotional fuel to continue the struggle to achieve my value. Now that's a kind of, I think, a good summary statement. I would certainly, speaking for myself, uh, endorse that. Uh, you may think I'm prejudiced because I'm a philosopher by profession, but I tried to indicate to you that this is not restricted to that uh, profession. To me personally, speaking for myself, the actual guidance of day-by-day -day life is entirely a function of philosophy. Any hope I have for the future depends on philosophy. It is like the invisible shield of self-protection protecting you from the slings and arrows of the world by constantly giving you the means to deal with them. And it is literally everywhere. I can't look anywhere. I'm like the Frenchman, you know, who can only see sex wherever he looks. And I see philosophy wherever you look, whether it's methods of thinking or value judgments or art or politics or people or books or newspapers, or you name it. I would actually be helpless. I would feel I couldn't function at all uh, without it. Now, I think you see that that's true actually of everybody, everybody on the face of the earth. But the difference is whether they admit it and whether they do it in terms of a deliberate conscious set of principles or whatever hash they have automatized, that is the issue. That's my answer to what is the role of philosophy in daily life. Next week, we're going to turn to philosophy and emotions. Thank you. <clears throat>
has ever had an opinion affected by a scientific discovery. Uh, they come to, to science with a certain philosophy, and this is unavoidable. Philosophy dictates science, not the other way around, because philosophy dictates epistemology. So epistemology comes before science. And if you come to science, you can only interpret it by, with, from the framework of some philosophy. And therefore, the science per se, apart from philosophy, doesn't prove anything. And it's, it's understandable, therefore, if these people come to, uh, to science from the perspective of extreme rationalism, they're prone to the idea that the choice is dogmatic revelation or skepticism. And then they see a revelation qualified, undercut, or whichever, so it seems to them, it's irresistible to apply their philosophy. So it's not really an aberration. It simply shows that philosophy is prior to science. And uh, you, you cannot convince people of a, who have a wrong philosophy by pointing to science. They'll just reinterpret science, that's all. Uh, somebody asked for the second time about applying the objective intrinsic subjective to art and makes a point that this is the second time he asked. So all I can say is I'm saving that question and I'm going to try to get to it. If, you're, if you've asked a question even from the very beginning and I haven't answered it, it doesn't prove I still have a fund of them allotted to different lectures and it's possible that one I want to answer next week because it'll be a better context. Now there's a long paper here in defense of mathematics. Um, and rather than read it all, I must clarify. Uh, the person, first of all, ascribes to me something I did not say. Namely, a mathematician tries to reduce to the fewest basic principles or axioms because he's insecure. I said a rationalist does that. But you can be a mathematician without being a rationalist, rare as that is. And per se, this person has a paragraph on that it would be valid to have the fewest axioms you can. And I wouldn't deny that. Why, I mean, William of Ockham is right, why multiply axioms beyond necessity? So I'm not opposed to reducing axioms to the only number required. Uh, but I was talking in the context of a rationalist who feels insecure. That's a different motive from whether there's an objective grounds to multiply or diminish your axioms. Now the other thing is he's, he takes offense, the questioner, at the statement which I think I did make. So I'll have to promptly retract it. The statement namely that mathematics is the easiest subject in the world. And he says I'm a mathematician. And then he outlines all the complexities, difficulties of mathematics, how many people can't perform trigonometry, et cetera. Uh, the role of mathematics, well, I have got to correct myself if I gave that implication. Obviously, mathematics, particularly as higher branches, is extremely abstract, extremely difficult. It takes great intelligence, and it has enormous applications to life and in science. And therefore, I would not want to have been heard as coming out against mathematics. That would be ludicrous. All I meant with that overstatement was that as a pattern of knowledge, as a model of knowledge, deduction, however complicated, is not comparable to induction. Induction requires a complexity of context and integration which has no parallel in, in, in deduction. And mathematics is deduction. In that specific sense, in no way derogating mathematics, I would still hold out for the fact that the basic method of thought in mathematics is easier than in, for instance, physics. Without denying it, it's extremely abstract, it takes enormous intelligence, and is extremely important. Now, I don't know if that appeases the questioner or not, but I should certainly have said that. Ayn Rand once said that the attribute that most distinguished her was not intelligence but honesty. Could she have been referring to a concept that subsumes the virtue of honesty 
and the lack of any innocent dishonesty such as rationalism. I, I, innocent dishonesty strikes me as a self-contradiction. If a person is dishonest, then he's guilty. If he's innocent, he tried his best, he was honest. So I, uh, you probably mean the correct method. He was not only honest, but had the correct method of thinking. Uh, and was that simply a result of honesty on her part? Well, honesty is our topic in Lecture 12, so I will simply be brief here. I have got to respectfully disagree with uh, Ms. Rand's self-assessment. I never agreed with that, and I argued her with her uh, for decades on that point. I regarded myself as thoroughly honest, and I never came anywhere near coming up with her philosophy on my own. I think that to explain the origination of an actual new philosophy, and honesty is a, is a valuable, necessary condition, but does not go the whole way. You can't get away from the fact, in my opinion, you have to be a genius on top of being honest. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what I would say uh, about that. I think it's understandable that a genius would not think of himself as a genius or herself, because that is the issue of the range that they can integrate into them that's obvious, that's how their mind functions, and therefore it would be natural to think that other people who can't do that, they just simply aren't focusing on the reality out there. Uh, I think that's very common. The genius is regarded as obvious things which to lesser mortals are very difficult to grasp. So I can only speak from my own perspective. Um, Two weeks ago, you answered a question about a hypothetical man who took the law into his own hands, killing his daughter's murderer who had been freed on a legal technicality. You said the father was wrong to do it, although you sympathized with his motive. What about Howard Rourke and the jury that acquitted him? Please do not answer this in lectures 10 or 11 because a friend is coming and he hasn't read The Fountainhead yet. <laughs> The uh, issue with regard to Rourke there, and how I would distinguish him from the other case you mentioned, is basically two things. Rourke's action occurred in a context where he had no alternative and no recourse, no other way to preserve his property. In other words, it was not within the framework of a government which had the law to protect crime, but simply had erred in its application. It was in the framework of a mixed economy government which appropriated, it was a government agency after all, his product, left him no means to reclaim it and specifically prohibited suing them. And consequently, he either had to capitulate altogether in a situation where there was no law defending the individual or he had to take it in his own hands. But the second point is this. Even so, Rourke would properly have to say, I am violating a law and you have a right to try me, and I'm prepared to take the consequences. That's what's called a test case. Where you think the law is unfair, if you have a prima facie decent reason, you can make a case for violating it, but then it has to be. You did it deliberately in order to challenge the law with the understanding that the defenders of the law will properly bring you into court, try you, and that the consequence may very well be life in prison. And that if that happens, you can't plead injustice because you said, I'm willing to take the consequences. This, to me, is more important. And that was exactly Rourke's attitude. He said explicitly, uh, I will spend the rest of my life in prison in preference to sanctioning this principle. Now, that's a different thing than saying, uh, I take the law in my own hands and you have no business, you see. So those are the two main points. Uh, a big jump now from the fountainhead to non-defining characteristic. When specifying the non-defining characteristics of a concept, do they always have to be universal, or can they, such terms as most apply? 
No, strictly speaking, the non-defining characteristics like the defining have to be universal throughout the species. Otherwise, they are not characteristics of that entity, if there's ever a case where they're not present. For instance, it would really be wrong to say that unemployment insurance is a characteristic of the welfare state, because uh, there have been welfare states, at least part of the time, such as the Weimar Republic, for, for close to a decade, without unemployment insurance. When, however, you find something like unemployment insurance, which is true of most, but not all, it's almost invariably because it indicates, if you go one step more abstract, something which is a universal characteristic. And therefore, it's not irrelevant as a preliminary exercise to focus on something which is true of most but not all cases, if you then make one step further back. So for instance, if you look at unemployment insurance, you will right away see that the general characteristic of which it's just a concrete is social insurance, some kind of government programs designed to protect you from the contingencies of life, from the perils of life. For instance, unemployment, accident, workman's compensation, old age, health insurance, etc. Now, not every such concrete has to be in every state, but the principle that unemployment insurance is an example of, namely, insurance against the, the problems of life provided by the government, that is universal, that's, that is an essential, although not a defining characteristic. You see what I mean? So that's how I would answer this. Now, <clears throat> All of the items you mentioned concerning the identity of consciousness, conceptualization, choice, etc., would have to be grasped by a process of introspection of one's own consciousness. This would have to be since one does not have direct awareness of any other consciousness except by observation of human behavior. By what technique or method can one know that upon introspection one is not just observing something particular to one's own consciousness, but something in general to uh, man's consciousness. Well, I think I gave the answer to that tonight, but this was asked several weeks ago. Uh, what, in a word, would be the technique or method by which you would decide, is this something local to your own consciousness or something universal to human consciousness? in one word with an I. Integration, that's all. And in this case, you would have to do two kinds of integration. To what you know about the nature of your consciousness, its essential nature, and to what you know about the actions of others. Now, for instance, take two different cases. You observe that you have a limited capacity to focus. You can only hold so many units, and after that your mind just goes. You can't hold it. In other words, the crow issue. Can you connect that to a knowledge of the nature of your consciousness? Well, yes, obviously. Your consciousness is limited. It's finite. It's capable of only grasping so much by the very nature of having an identity. Every consciousness would have to be limited or finite. You're tying it to the very principle of the law of identity. Do you, now on the other side, do you observe evidence that this is applicable to other men? Now, you can't observe their consciousness, but what can you observe? They can speak, they write, they talk, they function intellectually, and you can learn a tremendous amount about their consciousness from the external behavior. Do we see signs of the crow epistemology being applicable to others? Not that we can introspect their consciousness, but from observing their actions. Obviously, you just have to get up before a class and give them 79 principles and sit down. And they just look at you. They can't take it in. It's hopeless. It's just you can see the eyes glaze over. And they just tune out. So you can integrate it in two different ways. And so this is true of any principle of consciousness, just like of matter. On the other hand, you are repelled by snakes. 
That's a datum of your consciousness. You loathe them. Now, can you say this is a principle of human consciousness? Snake antipathy. <laughs> no. Why? Well, if you go to the nature of what you know about your consciousness, you know that your repulsion or attraction is a consequence of your evaluation. And therefore, if you connect what you know about how your consciousness operates, you'll say, no, this is obviously a function of my values. And I wasn't born with those, so why would everybody have to hold that? And then if you look at people, you'll see there are people who pet snakes and raise them, and have them for dinner, whatever all. <laughs> so you say, no, this is not a principle of human consciousness. It's the same issue as any normal induction. There's nothing more tricky uh, about it. Um, although intrinsicists say that consciousness can contribute nothing to the process of learning, are they not acting on their implicit acceptance of the primacy of consciousness? Yes. In other words, you're simply saying, to use another terminology, they are driven to subjectivism to carry out their philosophy, to their feelings. So they are subjectivists by implications. In the same way, a subjectivist ends up being an intrinsicist by implication, because where does he get his content from? As we've mentioned, since he can't generate the content of his own mind, and he doesn't get it from the outside, he gets it from the rationalists, who give him all their dogmas. So he ends up in practice being obedient to the intrinsicist. Each of these errors flops into the other, because each is half of a human mind trying to get along without the other half, so they oscillate each becomes the other. But that doesn't change the fact that they are basically different in their defining thrust. Um, now here's a question that I'm not clear about, really. Today there has been an abandonment of thinking, um, not simply a turn to empiricism versus rationalism, but a default in thinking as such. Can you comment on this? Well, whenever you get a generalization like this in America at the present, I would say you have to distinguish about whom are you talking, the intellectuals or the public. I don't think it's true that there's been a default or abandonment of thinking as such by the public. Within the limits of their knowledge, I think they think. Uh, the trouble is they're miseducated. Uh, and if they're skeptical of thinking at all, it's not an intrinsic or inherent antipathy to thought, is they have no idea how to begin, and the whole intellectual field is utter chaos. Uh, so it still comes down to this. The real culprits are the intellectuals. And the intellectuals are, and it's not helpful to say they don't think, because they don't keep their mouth shut either. They do something in its place. So what is it that they do? How do they function? And that's where you're still going to come down to the term setters, are rationalists or empiricists. Would you say that empiricists and rationalists share the following things? The value of understanding, the quest for truth, honesty, and the importance of ideas? No, I would not say that. Certainly an empiricist doesn't attach much value to understanding. Uh, he does not attach importance to ideas, but to the contrary. Let's put it this way. In the noblest cases of these two errors, they want to understand and grasp the truth, and they're honest, but uh, that uh, is not definitional, and there are lots who are not that noble. Uh, this is another question about, does an intrinsicist end up as, as a subjectivist? And the answer I've already given. Yes, in essence, they do. Would you say a few words on why Kant is a subjectivist or intrinsicist and not the other? Well, a few words, he's both. He is everything bad. Just as an example, he is father of modern subjectivism, because the whole essence of his epistemology is our consciousness has a definite nature, therefore we can never know reality. 
So he's a thorough uh, subjectivist. We're trapped within our own categories and modes of operation, and we can never know the truth. On the other hand, his ethics, to take an easy, obvious example, is thoroughly intrinsicist. There's this entity in true reality, which he calls the noumenal self, which shoots forth categorical imperatives or commandments, which you just have to obey because they're ordered, there is no context, etc. So he's a thorough intrinsicist. And his whole philosophy is to make subjectivism dominate epistemology so that religious intrinsicism can take over in ethics. So he's the union of everything then. Now, we're going back a long time, but I'm going to give about five more minutes to questions that came in weeks ago that I've been carrying around. The topic, the nature of man, does not seem to fall under ethics because it is a foundation for ethics. It does not seem to fall under metaphysics because it's too specialized. And it's certainly not part of epistemology. Would you classify it as a separate branch of philosophy in addition to the other main branches? Well, I think the best thing is to say it's the application of metaphysics and epistemology to the nature of man. So it's, you can call it the philosophy of man, but it really has no separate data. Its principles are the nature of the universe and the nature of knowledge, and then just churning out the conclusions. For instance, metaphysics tells us consciousness and existence have no war. Philosophy of man tells you there has to be mind, body, uh, uh, integration, etc. So that this is, it's not worth giving it the name of a special branch, although it's a special point that you have to reach and develop. Uh, would you consider writing a detailed explanation of the virtue of honesty in the matter that Miss Rand explained it to you in that three-hour discussion sometime in the future? I can only say my future is not that long, and I have an awful lot of other things to do first. So I don't have no plans to do that. But hopefully, you could do that on the basis of grasping the general principles. This is a question that came in very early, I think, lecture one. Isn't there a great danger in viewing an abstract philosophical principle in the truck-like fashion? Remember, we were talking about that. Because an abstraction is so far removed from the perceptual level, you must constantly keep in mind the uncertainty associated with it, um, uh, along with its enormous power, or you might not understand the context to which your abstraction applies. And viewing it in that truck-like fashion subverts this proper way of keeping concepts in your mind. Well, I essentially disagree with that. because. That was, after all, an analogy. No one could hold a concept literally as you hold a percept, because it isn't a percept. You have to drop percepts to hold the concept. You have to range across a tremendous category. So if you took from my statement the implication, you should unthinkingly apply concepts once they're chewed, because after all, they're direct revelations of reality. That is a misinterpretation which I did not intend. What I did intend is the concept must be concretely tied to a range of data in reality as immediately accessible to you when you focus on it as the truck in the perception. And there's nothing in that that says you have to become blind or a dogmatist or ignore context. One of the things that should be real to you, if it's a principle, is it applies within a specific context. That's part of concretizing it. So there should be nothing there that uh, prevents you uh, from, from being rational. I think we'll stop at this point and continue next time. Thank you.